Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Riff Hard Podcast. Our guest today is Josh Middleton from Silosis, formerly of Architects. He's a great, great guitar player. I think one of the best riffers, one of the best right hands in all of metal. And uh, he's also a really great mixer. He's on Nail the Mix this month doing Poison for the Lost by Silosis. They have a new album called A Sign of Things to Come. And uh, let's get into it. Well, Josh Middleton, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Excited to be back. Anytime. Lots of changes, man. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. It's a uh, it's one of those things where um I don't know about you and I'm curious, but for me every like big upheaval in my life or like major change has led to the next best thing I've ever done like without fail. Like it's never gone in a bad direction. So I'm wondering how how that how you interpret that sort of thing yeah i i know what you mean i i have that like not to get too like woo woo about this sort of thing but yeah i i start to notice like synchronicities like just like loads of weird coincidences and maybe that's related or maybe i'm just like looking into it too much but um yeah i i know what you mean and i i'm just yeah keeping a yeah like a forward momentum on on my life and yeah I, I feel good about stuff now, yeah. Good. Um, well, you know, I think that the so those synchronicities and whether or not you're just the one noticing them, um, like I feel like when someone goes through a change, they, you know, they can choose how they want to react to it. And so if they choose to feel like it's the end of the world. They're going to look for all the evidence that lets them know that they're right. And they also feel like it's the pathway to something, you know, even better, then they're going to look for the evidence to support that as well and find it. That's at least in my experience, I've noticed that, um, once if I like, if I believe that making this move is the right thing and I really do believe it, I'm going to start looking for evidence to prove that I'm right. Um, that's not great when you're doing actual science, but, uh, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's very life, good. Yeah. yeah. It's the works. Yeah. Like manifesting things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it kind of just happens. I mean, it, my, weirdly enough, like my, me entering architects was a similar thing of like, um, I'd already put silences on hold, even though we hadn't announced it. And then, um, just like moved in with my wife, like got a house together, but I had no way of paying the bills. And then, I regretted not joining Architects when they had asked, and then everything that happened with Tom, it was instantly like, oh, well, here you go. Like, here's like, you join Architects, could start paying my, my bills every month, all that sort of stuff, just like, almost like just fell into place instantly. So, yeah, it's weird when that sort of thing happens, but you just kind of... Got to go with it. Flow. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering on the silosis end, uh, what was it like sustaining a band um, like Silosis with it not being able to be, you know, the main thing? Like how did you keep uh, it? How did you keep it alive? So it it wasn't alive from like 2016 uh, to 2019. There was like nothing, like nothing happening at all, and. I I feel like the band was like j- just enough, just the right level where we were big enough that people would still discover us and we wouldn't just completely drop off the face of the earth. Like we'd done a good amount of albums, we did some good touring uh, and made a name for ourselves and carved our own little path in, in the metal world. And uh, yeah, it, it actually seemed like all that time away, like made the band bigger. You know, sometimes yep. that works. Some, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, just very fortunate. I feel like Solosis is, you know, not the biggest band at the moment, but we have quite like a cult-like following, like fans that are into it are really into it. It's an interesting um, phenomenon, don't you think? Like, because I kind of, yeah. I kind of just went through the same thing. Not uh, Doth isn't as big as Silosis, but still, we took twelve years where nothing happened. And the streaming numbers, again, they're not huge, but they still grew consistently without doing anything and then bring it back. There was definitely um, a small but dedicated 
group of people who are ready for it, which has made it a lot easier than if it was just completely forgotten. But I've noticed that like, yeah, sometimes just having had a good run and leaving it out there is enough for things to pick up their own momentum, which is really weird. Yeah, I mean, if you look at some bands, nothing really comes to mind. I'm sure there's much better examples, but like some of the thrash stuff that I like, like X Order or whatever, like they kind of just, after the 90s, were nothing and then do nothing. But then you start, you know, people like me who went there at the time start looking back at all this old thrash stuff and discovering bands. And like you quite quickly run out of, you know, Sepultura and Metallica. So you have to dig a bit deeper and you find out Forbidden, Testament, all these bands. And, uh, just they, they just naturally get like a second wind just from from that I think and uh, maybe maybe it's a similar thing for our bands but I, also I think both Darth and Solosis were uh, doing our own thing at a time when most yes. people were doing something else and that helped at the time kind of put, put us in our own little spot on our own which is kind of cool yeah because you don't get dated to that time yeah. period. Yeah, I, that's what I, I was thinking about that when listening to Silosis to get ready for this, that like, I, and I think that this is a good thing because actually I, I talk about this a lot with, uh, with um, my co-writers and Doth is like, not to consciously try to be anything other than to write the best music possible, but not ever worry about what's going on because at the end of the day, you're not doing it for right now. like. You're doing it for five years from now, 10 years from now. It, like when people are listening to it 10 years from now or even 20, are they going to think of that time period and a sea of bands that all like make up that time period or are you going to stand out? And I think that being true to yourself um, allows for that. And I definitely heard that with Silosis because I can't really like pin it in any one space. I mean, it's definitely metal. That's That's for sure. But but besides that, like I can't really pin it on any genre. Therefore, I can't really pin it in a time period. Like if it had different production, I could easily have heard it in the '90s or currently, but not in a way that it sounds dated. It's just one of those things where you can't really put a time on it. And I think that that's could be part of why it stayed alive. Yeah, I I think so. Yeah, I mean it's really hard to to know exactly but I, I I agree with you like what you said about just trying to write the best music you can whatever it may sound like just write it as the best you can and just the whole point with Silosis is try, to try and become my own favorite band like what if I could put all my favorite bands and everything I want to listen to in one project like let's do it but not that I do listen to Silosis all the time but that, mm. that would be the intention and I find yeah. it weird when people in bands like their favorite band is this band and the band they're in it sounds nothing like that at all. And and it's the only band they do. Like if you've got side projects, like I I like industrial stuff and I've written like an album's worth of industrial and electronic music, which may never see the light of day, but it's not my favorite genre, but I still really like it. But it's weird when people just do one thing but it's not their I don't know, what what they're really into. Yeah, it's there's a lack of congruency, I guess, um, or coherence. I, I think though that like um, it, it, there's this delicate balance because I remember the other day in the Riffard group, somebody posted a question about writing. Um, the uh, how do you know when a riff's good enough? Like, how do you know when something's like good or that you need to keep working? And like, my you know, that. I feel like we all go through that struggle, no matter what level you're at, you go through that struggle of not knowing when something's good enough. But at the end of the day, one thing that I've noticed is I actually do have an internal gauge. I'm wondering if you, if this rings a bell for you, I have this internal gauge where like, there will be some things I write that I just get excited about. I get excited about and like, I'm just like, this is the shit and I'm into it. And I like to think that those moments, I'm the biggest fan ever of that thing or of the band in that moment in time. And getting that feeling, it, it's like never been wrong. Like when I feel that, like if I feel that, other people will feel it. And it's the stuff that I don't feel that way about where the results have been mixed. And so my thoughts to that person were basically along the lines of, 
How is your own music making you feel? Like, could you say that you're the biggest fan in the world of your own music? Yes or no? Um, like, when you hear it, that riff, do you get this fuck yeah feeling? I want to punch a wall? Or is it like, eh? That, that's exactly. important. Like, what, what about you? How do you know? Yeah, I, that's exactly the same as me. I, I have that. I mean, even if you're not, like, punching a wall, which is, like, exactly what I'm looking well, no, for when I'm Well, no, don't this. actually punch a wall. <laughs> but that that's, like, something that's come up so recently for me because I've been trying to inject more of that, like, youthful energy into our music because I feel like years of playing guitar in front of a computer, getting better, more finesse in the songwriting as a player, kind of lost some of the... Just that ex- youthful yep. excitement and that electricity of like when you listen to like Slipknot, you just want to trash your bedroom. But yeah, so even if you don't punch a wall, one thing, yeah, if if you've written something and you just listen back to it about 20 times on repeat yep. like, and you just keep wanting to listen to it, that's it. That means you like it, I guess. I mean, that, that's what I do. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah. I, you just kind of know. I, I, I mean, I do. I Maybe some people don't know, <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, you just want to try and write stuff that you're, like you say, you're a fan of. That's the whole point for me. Well, well, the thing is, when I don't know, when uh, I find that when I'm like, eh, about a part, I've never regretted rewriting that part. Because I feel like if I'm like, so-so about a part, that's generally not going to change. I'm still going to feel that way years from now, almost always. So I don't know, I feel like, if you feel so, so about a part, maybe you do know, you know that you got to do something to it. Yeah. Maybe you're not supposed to feel good about it because it's not ready. I, I definitely try and seek out, um, as much external opinions these days than ever before. Mm-hmm. Um, so, cause sometimes there's a fine line with riffs or anything you write, if it's like simplistic and there's such a fine line between like something that's like, you know, genre defining like walk by pantera or doing something that's just boring <laughs> you know it's <laughs> yes. just so simple so like you sometimes you can get a little bit confused or like you need to like take a step away from it and just rely on other people's input um maybe but for the most part yeah i'm i'm only trying to like impress myself or just write stuff that i want to hear or that i'm going to get excited by so yeah you just have to try and be your own favorite band or if you're writing specifically for a project like if it's going to be that band what would you want that band to be doing that's actually a great point man but the simplistic riffs those are the hardest ones to know because i've noticed that like i wonder with morbid angel when where the slime live was written like did they have that thought too like did that in the pantera rehearsal room when walk was happening were they thinking that because i know when i've written simplistic things i'm like is this stupid or is this cool like is this just awesome or is it like just stupid like and yeah and it's hard it's like hard to know sometimes Uh, to be honest i've only just got better at at this recently and kind of let go because solosis in the past had a lot of before we went on hiatus, had so many like boundaries and like rules around what we could and couldn't do. Because around the time that we, before we just did our first record in 2008, it was like metalcore and deathcore. Everyone was down tuning, playing the same breakdowns, playing through the same amps at every show. And just, it was just, everyone sounded the same. So I was like, right, we're tuning up to E. It's going to be like no breakdowns. It's going to be like and justice for all. And we're just going to do our own thing. And that was the thrash revival stuff happening, but we weren't really specifically part of that and it was kind of cool that it it did set set us apart from everything that was going on and we went down to more like you know listening to death the band death a Mm -hmm. lot (laughs) and that was a big inspiration for us and still is but um i i was had too many rules about stuff if it it couldn't be too simple or too like meathead because people might think it's hardcore or something even though i grew up listening to hate breed and loads of hardcore bands because we wanted to appeal to the proper metal crowd yep. which i don't think metal fans are, are as elitist as they were like 10 20 years ago i think it's a lot more inclusive of death metal fans can appreciate deathcore bands whereas back you know when it came out it was like nope yeah <laughs> um and i don't i don't care about that now i don't care what anyone thinks so if we do something that resembles a breakdown or something really simplistic i don't care and we still have the technical stuff so 
doesn't matter. But I used to be like, oh, I guess we can't do anything too simple and have to make things a bit more interesting. But you know, I'm over over that. It's a. Uh, it, I feel like. Um, do you like Demo Borg gear at all? Love them. They they were actually like a huge influence on me doing. Sorry to go off. <laughs> sweet picking arpeggios because when I had blessings on the throne of tyranny, do all the yep. all the all the piano, piano lines sweeps. I was like, I love all the, the that it's accenting all these different key changes where like black metal you move just minor chords around. Uh, but I don't like I don't want it to sound black metal. So I was like, okay, I'm going to learn sweet picking arpeggios and move them around, and it's not going to be like a lead thing. It's going to be outlining mm-hmm. chord changes. Um, so sorry, but yeah, they're they're like a huge inspiration for us. But anyway. Well, that first, first of all, that's very cool. But so it's going to bring up the song Puritania. Yeah. Yeah. So that song, first of all, if you look on Spotify, that's their biggest song. Um, yeah. if, I believe, or at least last time I checked, it was the biggest song in terms of streams. And on that album, I love that album, um, Puritanical. It's fantastic. I think that's my favorite song, along with Blessings. But like... Puritania, I remember the first time I heard it, um, thinking to myself, balls, they have balls because like, yeah. it's nothing like the rest of the record. It's slow. It's so simple. It's so, so simple, but it's so cool. And yeah. imagine if they were, if they were thinking this is too simple or something like it's too simple or like too basic. Well, we, we, we can't do it that. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they, they took a step back from that record and went a bit more black metal with Death Cult and then even more so. Mm-hmm. Like, but for me, Puritanical was my gateway into that band and like the really thrashy, progressive and Nick Barker's drumming, all of that stuff was like what I was after. I love all that stuff, yeah. but that one for me was just, it's still like top 10 records of all time for me probably. Same here. I, I just, I wonder if like, it, it just would have been such a huge mistake to not do that song. And if they, yeah, get, I wonder if they got backlash at the time. I don't know if they did, but I don't, I don't know either. So, all right. I want to hear about these piano arpeggios for guitar. So I think that's actually a really um, good way to expand your vocabulary as a musician is to learn things from other instruments and uh, make them work on guitar. Um, because people, who play other instruments but just because of the physical layout of the instrument and its parameters and boundaries, they will approach things differently. So like having huge arpeggios that span octaves and octaves and octaves on a piano um, are a lot easier because all the notes are right in front of you. They only happen once and you just go in one direction and then back the other. Whereas on guitar, you have to really really plan it out Um, because you have multiple directions you could go. um, The same notes appear in multiple places and you have to really be strategic about it and can really help you get outside of, I guess, the stock, like with arpeggios, for instance, learning how a pianist does it can help you get outside of the stock um, way that a guitar player will do arpeggios. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Oh yeah, the other guitarist in Solos is, is I literally saw a video of him today. He's like on piano, like mm-hmm. incredible. And uh he he was like, Yeah, it's way easier <laughs> to do that on a piano than it is on a guitar. It doesn't take away from it being impressive, but yeah, yeah it's uh, it's designed for it. That's that's the thing. So yeah. you have to kind of like think of how you're gonna do it on guitar. So like did you figure it out by ear and then just like make it work uh, like what's what was the process if you remember no i think my guitar teacher showed me like the basic major and minor arpeggio shapes um and i couldn't get sweet picking for ages i'd practice it and then nothing and then practice it and then just couldn't do it and then two weeks off and then pick up the guitar and i could just do it which seems to happen for a lot of people and i think one thing just going off on tangents that i always stress to people about practicing is just like you don't have to be like in your mind to practice like the most of the practicing i probably did that was beneficial was i do an hour of proper practice with a metronome and practice my scales and everything 
But then later on at night when everyone's gone to bed, I put the TV on and just practice the arpeggios. And I'm not thinking about it. It's just like it's going in. It's muscle memory. It's just like going to the gym. It's just repeat the movement, do it slowly. And after, if you do it enough times, your your body remembers what it's supposed to do. Um, but yeah, with with the the arpeggio stuff, yeah, that was Demi Borgir, and then Dechristianized by Vital Remains. Oh, yeah. You know that song with the, the sweet baking thing. I was like, because I didn't want to do it in some like cheesy like neoclassical solo way. I was just using it to like outline. We didn't want to have a keyboard player in the band. We wanted to be like not like Demon War Gear, but I like the whole black metal, like outlining all those cool dark yeah. core progressions and stuff. So um, that's what's yeah, cool that's about arpeggio. I, I think that's what's cool about arpeggios. They don't have to be a lead. They they have so many different uses. It could be part of a lead. It could be part of a texture. It, it could be your rhythm. It could just be like outline. Like there's so many different ways that they're useful. Yeah, for sure. I, I always like to try and just create like hypnotic loops or like synth, I guess like synth lines or something you might get in dance music. It mm-hmm. just repeats, but not necessarily just like in a solo. You, you know, I've noticed that. Like I, I used to think about that a lot. Um, and every once in a while, I still do it with arpeggios that there's a way to play them that doesn't sound like you're just like, sweeping stupidly in a solo now sometimes sweeping is cool in a solo but like you know what i mean there's a way to where if you loop it properly you can get a very entrancing trippy really really cool sound like and that really contains a really good chord progression in it and also like i guess the foundations for a melody as well like you can have a very very compelling part if a properly looped uh, arpeggio sequence. Yeah. I think one of our, our biggest songs is called Imperial, which is track two or three off Edge of the Earth record. That's um, exactly that. Just like a hypnotic sweep thing that just goes on <laughs> over like, and just outline some cool uh, chords, I guess, or the arpeggios. Like, if, you know, I think it's like a dominant major thing and nothing like that people haven't heard before, but I think it, at, the, at the time, back in like 2011, we were, not many other people were doing that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone's already heard all the notes. It's how yeah. how you use them. Um, so you're saying that like, you definitely do the hour of structured practice. Um, what do you, what, how do you structure it now? I, to be honest, I haven't really practiced guitar in any real sense in years. Like I, I did most of my wood shedding when I was 16. And that was when I'd do at least an hour a day, metronome on. And I, the main mm-hmm. thing I'd practice was my modes. So I'd go start on an F Ionian and go up one down the next, up one down the next, and then get to the octave, try and make no mistakes and pick every note. And that was like the main thing that I practiced. And I still think it's, super beneficial like learning to pick three notes per string alternate picked really aggressively and at the same time I was just my muscle memory and was memorizing all these mode shapes and I think once you really understand the modes as a guitarist it opens up so much theory or like just so much understanding like I can talk to string players in the studio about when we're recording like strings for the architect stuff and I was like oh that note's I know it's Dorian, like it's just meant to be early and like you put stuff like that and they can understand it. And I can like, yeah, I, but I, I definitely don't have like crazy like jazz knowledge or anything like that. But I feel like the modes and, and then other scales like harmonic minor and then the modes within that and melodic minor. I feel like as a guitarist, once you get them down, you've opened your uh, your theory knowledge up quite a bit. I mean, it, it's basically most of what will ever come up. Yeah, pretty pretty yeah. much. So then, what what does your guitar life consist of now? Writing, really. It's just I spend as much time as I can writing, as if it's like a, a day job. Um, and yeah, I'll try and write stuff that I don't. I don't go out of my way to write stuff that's difficult or harder than I've ever done. But um, 
sometimes that happens. And every now and then, like during the pandemic, I set myself the task to learn at least the first two minutes of Stab Wound by Necrophagist. And uh, that's a good one. That's a good, yeah, that's exactly. a good so, goal. I, I definitely do my, like to make sure that I keep my chops up. And every now and then, if I feel like I haven't played much, I'll just work on something whilst watching TV, like work on like a Symphony X thing, like how to play Inferno, like the lead part and that sort of stuff. And I'll, or I'll just check my repertoire of all the licks and the technical stuff that I do know. And can I still play it as well as I could? And if so, cool. And if not, I'll I'll work on it. But I don't have any um, goals of being like the fastest guitarist uh, on the planet or anything like that. I, I want to focus on the music being the best it can be and then the solos just being like cool solos and like expressive and, and that kind of thing. Uh, Having said that, there's still technical stuff coming. So I, I think that that's really, uh, really an interesting and wise approach because you only have, and we're, and you're also mixing now. So like, which we'll talk about in a bit, but like, you've got a lot of stuff going on at the same time. Any one of those things could be your full-time job. Like you could make just guitar your job, um, could make the band your job. Um, but a band is multiple aspects. You could make mixing your only job. Like you have to be very selective about how you use your time. And so you can't just sit there for like six hours every day and just like go through everything on guitar. And it, so it seems to me like it's important to be very strategic about what you're trying to do. So you identified trying to write, that's the priority. Um, obviously you got to be able to play this stuff too, because it's in a band context. Um, then it makes sense to me that what you're doing is you're, even though you're not sitting there with a metronome every single day, you're still doing maintenance and still making sure that there's no degradation happening. So like routine checks and, uh, yeah. and that's, I think that's really wise because you hear about this a lot. You hear about writers, like people who used to play a lot and then shifted to writing getting worse or people who start mixing getting worse at guitar. I experienced it. Um, when I, you know, when my period in my career where I started doing the studio full time, like right um, after Doth went on hiatus, like my guitar playing got better for a little bit, but then it stopped getting better because it was no longer, no longer the focus. And um, I think what I could have done differently is exactly what you're saying, which is to check up on things, make sure you can still do them. Um, you don't have to have a goal of like, going to be the fastest guitar player in the world. Um, but like a goal of like being able to play your own music and keep up with that and maintain that level of proficiency. I think that that's, it's wise to approach it that way. And it's wise to make sure that you don't let that go because this stuff's hard. Yeah. I think I only re really got to the standard that I'm at um, with maybe a bit of that kind of youthful, um, wanting to impress kind of thing or but i also kind of draw a lot of similarities between guitar playing and skateboarding like yep. it's just satisfying when you land a trick and you do it smoothly and it's satisfying if you can nail a thing on the guitar without making any mistakes so it's just like it was kind of just fun to be able to oh i can do this like i've achieved something the same with skateboarding um i don't think like i would necessarily try and be <clears throat> like the best guitarist or like the the standard I'm at now, because all, all my favorite bands, it's not super shreddy technical stuff like Pantera, Metallica, Sepultura. None of those guys were. I mean, Dimebag, I guess you could say it was a virtuoso, but um, like for sure, yeah. But it wasn't like everything about their music. And you listen to a song like Becoming, and it's there's nothing virtuoso about that song or the solos. Just like it feels heavy. It's just the awesome. solo feels aggressive. And that's what I was chasing. Even with like the fast picking, I, I wanted to practice picking three note per string all my modes because I wasn't really a fan necessarily of like Black Label Society. But when I heard Zach Wild play and it was like, it just sounded sick. It sounded really aggressive. And like when it's super clean and like picked really aggressively, it just sounds Man, energetic. Have yeah, you seen... Cool that video of him from like Ozfest 2002 
where he's playing the Black Label Society version of No More Tears. Does that sound familiar at all? I don't know if I have. You should look. It, so. You should look it up. It's like yeah, from like 2000 or 2001 or two. Yeah, he's. It's the solo and it's the Black Label Society version. And motherfucker is on fire. I just thought of it because of the sound you made when you described the picking. Like he is. <laughs> Yeah, but like down low too, he's like picking so hard and so fast and yeah. clean and aggressive. It's like, fuck, this is awesome. And he he's an example, I think, of a guitar player that is a complete virtuoso, like just amazing, technically amazing guitarist. But you don't really l- just lump him in with like the dudes that just do clinics or like these like guitar guys. Like he is a guitar guy, but he's also in a band, and I don't think he's out there trying to. I don't know. Yeah, that, that that's. I, I never really got into much of like the instrumental instrumental music, or, or I always liked people that did what they did in a band context. Or even mm-hmm. like Trey from Morbid Angel. He was like huge influence when I was a kid. Like I was just that that level. Or just like I wanted to be able to not be limited in my ability. If I wanted to do something like that, I could. But I could also go back to just playing something really simple. It's only later on in life I realized a lot of my favorite Morbid Angel solos are. Eric, but <laughs> um, <laughs> he's great. But yeah, yeah, yeah that, that that's um, for me. It's all about just trying to write the best music and write music that I'm going to have a reaction to, and therefore, hopefully, someone else will. That 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, I I think that uh, it's it's really important. Some something you just said that you don't have to getting good at guitar is not because you necessarily want to become a clinician or something so i think that there's i see this attitude that people have towards getting better where they're well they'll say like well you know that i i don't want to play prog or i i don't want to do that kind of stuff so th- this doesn't matter that's why i don't practice or something like that it's like eh, that doesn't that that's not what it's about. Like being as good as you possibly can, um, you know, within the parameters of what you want to do is never a bad thing. Um, and there are certain things that are good for like any musician, like some basic knowledge of keeping time of some basic theory knowledge, like how to have like a structured routine. So you know how to learn stuff like those types of things, they'll help anybody. And, learning some stuff, getting better at your instrument doesn't mean that you have to become a clinician. Like those dudes that are clinicians, it's very hard to get there. You have to like really, you have to make a decision and then devote your life to being that good. Like it's not just going to casually happen because you learned your modes. Like you're not going to learn your modes and then go play clinics. Like there's about 10,000 steps after just learning your modes before you're capable of doing clinics. You have to really, really want that, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's kind of, it, it just sort of takes over and you just become like the guitar guy or or the drum guy that just is known for being amazing at drums but not really like a band guy or, or a writer. I think going back to what we said about like practicing and continue like where I'm at now, I spend so much time recording and I think that is like the biggest, like the, the, one of the best things anyone can do, whether they're a drummer, a guitarist, bass player, I, I'm writing every day and I'm recording myself every day. And even if it's just going to get re-recorded, I'm trying to play as tight as I can because it just, it's more satisfying to listen back to a demo yes. that sounds good. So like, and recording yourself every single day. I mean, I used to record myself on a four track tape recorder, like in the early 2000s. So like, I've always been doing it and I can just, I mean, I can see I'm like, oh, am I ahead of the beat? Like, I need to work on my timing. I need to like learn to sit back a bit or I can just hear a mistake or I can hear this unwanted string noise. How am I going to figure out how to stop doing that? And I think recording yourself, being able to take a step back and listen to something the next day and be like, oh, that's not as tight as I would have liked it to have been. I need to work on whatever it was that made that mistake has always been part of my practice or like figuring out where I need to put my attention so being as clean as possible comes from recording and just not wanting to hear it and not wanting to rely on editing yeah that makes sense because while you're playing 
you, it's impossible to have a truly objective uh, understanding of what you sound like while you're playing because there's too much stuff going on. Like feeling it through your body, you might, if you're not wearing headphones, you're hearing it bounce around the room. If you're engineering yourself, part of your brain is dedicated towards what's happening in the DAW. You're thinking of, about the part. Like, there's so many different things taking up your attention that, like, maybe you're hearing pick noise also, and that might make you think it sounds more percussive than it actually does. There's like a bu- and there's a bunch more I didn't name, but there's like a lot of stuff that can get in the way of you hearing yourself clearly. And so the only way to really know is to record yourself and listen back. Unless, you know, if you work with a great engineer or producer and they tell you that was good or not good, cool. That can help you from going in circles. But just if, for the exercise of self-assessment and being honest with yourself, you can't do that while you're playing. It's just impossible. Like, you're not going to be accurate um, in how you perceive yourself. But if you record yourself or you film yourself and record yourself, that's now that's accurate. And that's a true picture of what your abilities are. And then you can, I feel like by doing that and then analyzing what you do, you can make a lot of progress very, very quickly because it's so targeted towards what's yeah. actually wrong. Definitely. I, I think that's the, the main thing for me. I was like, just the cleanliness. Like you listen to like, you know, Injustice for All and there's no like <laughs> on every, like that was track to tape. And when I had my four track tape recorder, I could only get as good as that by playing it as tightly as I could. And you just have to work on whatever it is you might hear that you don't like the sound of. But yeah, like you say, it just instantly throws things up that you may have overlooked and they might be like crucial things to work on. Um, I, I've noticed, yeah, to me, like, I've noticed know, like, cleanliness is important. Dude, even down to like your picking angle, like on certain strings, like y- you can get this weird squeak from like your picking angle. And just like there's so many things that you might not realize that you do that like b- get revealed. And sometimes it's not obvious why it sounds a certain way. So you have to adjust lots of different things. But once you figure it out, like, oh, it's, it's not just the pick angle, but where I'm playing on that string in relation to the pickup or whatever, that's what I need to adjust. Once you figure that stuff out, like, you know it. You, you're you now aware of how how to get out of making that particular sound. Yeah, for sure. So as everybody knows, you know, you're a mixer. You're a Nail the Mix this month. It's uh, It's really cool to me, and I think it's really inspiring to people both – on the riff hard side of it and the URM side of it, because in my opinion, and tell me what you think, I, I feel like the modern definition of being a musician has changed. And, you know, there was a point in time where a musician could be defined by being a player. Then a player, you add a step to that, a player who knows how to network. Then you add a step to that, a player who knows how to network, who can kind of record themselves then you add to that a player who uh, can network, who can kind of record themselves, has some video capabilities plus some social media capabilities. Like the definition of what it takes to like be out there um, on a professional level just keeps on expanding. It keeps on growing. And I think that like being a mixer, being a producer, uh, it's not a requirement that you get to like best in the world status or anything, but just having a working knowledge of it is a very important part of being a modern musician. And uh, so I'm wondering, you getting started, like when you got started in mixing, were you starting as just like a musician to record themselves? Or was it like, I'm going to get good at this from the get-go? Uh, it was more of the former. So when we... First started the band, it was like 2001 or something. We were still kids. And then, we, like most studios, probably would have, well, when we did our first demo, it was on ADAT. Um, and we were still in school for that. And then, yeah, they didn't have a, com- a computer in that studio. But then, yeah, like home recording stuff became pretty cheap and available not long after that. Um, basically, it was just money. Like, I, 
had identified all the records that I liked the sound of, and they all had two names, Andy Sneap or Colin Richardson on them. And uh, I was trying to, yes. you know, you look around at like local studios and what you can afford. And the results weren't anything like that. And it would cost us like tons of money to go in and record it and like, you know, to record it, get the tight takes, the performances. So I was like, I'm just going to learn how to do this myself. And it, I might not, I may not be very good, but at least I've got time on my side. So the first two EPs that Solos has put out on a small label um, were recorded by me. I just bought like a an interface with like eight eight mics for drums. Oh yeah, uh, bought a set of like fifty seven. I yeah, remember those part. days. Yeah, I mean it was just necessity, and uh, you know, obviously, I just sample replace the drums and just <laughs> the cymbals would be uh, real, but. Um, yeah, I, I, it was just necessity. Like, you know, local engineers that we could afford, are they going to get the results we want? No, am I? Maybe not, but I'm, I know exactly what I'm after. So you'll get better. So I can, yeah, so you can just try and keep trying. So that's, that's why. And then I've always just loved listening to music that sounds good, like metal productions. I think the first thing I heard by Andy Sneap was like a Pissing Razor song on a crying CD from their first record but um and it sounded just so metallic and i was just like that d4 piccolo snare sample if i don't hear that on a snare <laughs> i'm it doesn't sound metal to me uh yeah so i, I just have city. like a yeah the, those two so i just I, I have a aesthetic that's just imprinted like on me from that era of getting into metal and early 2000s stuff like the killer switch records and chimera all, all the stuff colin did as well um that kind of aesthetic. So I, I always just, and I would check out bands that those guys had mixed or produced, um, even if I didn't really like the band that much. Even, But if it's going to sound satisfyingly good to listen to, like the tones and everything and the snares pop in, like, I'd get excited by the production. So, um, yeah, and it's just easy. I always wanted to be able to write and record my own demos and being able to demo stuff properly to a high level uh, to enhance your writing so I can sit with a song, remember it all for one, and move parts around and change drum beats underneath stuff. So recording myself for demoing purposes was hugely important. And at the same time, I wanted the demos to sound good. So when I show them to the rest of the guys in the band, like it doesn't sound like garbage. They can be like, try and get as excited as what's in my head because the better yep. it sounds, the better it's going to translate. And they'll be like, oh, that's cool because... You know, we're talking about like a fine line between between something that's really simple being good or bad. If it's got really bad production, you may not know that it's actually that good. But if it you might, might sound yeah, quite decent, you it's might be help. working against yourself. So this is like a Jira. Some of their really simple yeah. stuff. It they don't rely on the production, but it, it helps. Dude, you know, I just had this conversation with somebody in the Riff Hard group. So. Uh, we just merged URM and Riff Hard. So like now, like anyone who's in Riff Hard has Nail the Mix. Anyone who has Nail the Mix has Riff Hard. It's all on the same site. And like, so now there's really no excuse to um, have bad sounding demos. But we do this like, we do this songwriting competition every month. And there's this one member who's awesome at writing and guitar. Awesome, but terrible at recording and mixing. I mean, bad real bad and so bad that it hurts the music and that's that's kind of the the thing is like you don't have to try to like be the next will putney or the next andy sneep that's a, but if your music that you're showing to other people it doesn't sound good enough to get the point across at least you're doing yourself a disservice because you're asking them to imagine what it would be like if, yeah. and not everyone can imagine that. Like maybe you no, give it to a producer and they could imagine it, but just like people, regular people or lots of musicians who have never recorded or just like even people who have might not be able to understand where you're going with this and might overlook a really great idea or like blow you off, um, write you off or think you're not serious because of how this sounds. And again, it doesn't mean you have to be 
Will Putney level or something like that, or the next Jens Bogren or anything. But it's not that hard to get stuff sounding decent, at least these days. It takes a little bit of effort, but I feel like because the standard has gotten so high um, that you kind of have to know some, you have to, you got to have some level of being able to make your stuff sound decent. Yeah, it helps when there's like at least one member of a band that can put a demo together because now and then there'll be like a band where they, no, no one in the band has any idea of recording and you're trying to like get pre-production ideas together or like hear the songs and map tempos out and stuff and Old it's just school. the amount of work <laughs> the amount of work that is then on you is is doubled uh, or I mean now and then it would be there'd be one guy in a band who was really good at Guitar Pro and the demos would just be Guitar Pro MIDI which sucks but at least you everything's quite like <laughs> Can just it's better, than, the better. It's better I mean, than nothing, man. I remember tracking yeah. tracking songs to Guitar Pro, like bands, big bands, bands that right now you look at their tours and they're like playing arenas, like bands who I've worked with in the studio at different points. Like I'm just I'm saying this just to say, like serious bands. I've been in the studio with them where the drummer is playing to guitar lines as MIDI piano because, and it sounds fucking ridiculous, uh, but that's what they do because they, this, they have since, since that was a while ago, since then, you know, two members of this one band in particular, I'm thinking of have DAWs and like every band who's done this, that I worked with now have at least two members who can handle demoing. But yeah, in that, Initial Guitar Pro plus an Mbox era, yeah, like they wouldn't even track their own uh, scratch guitar. So we'd be sitting there tracking these metal drums to like the worst piano sound ever, and they were cool with it. Um, it I I didn't know if we were making a comedy album or metal, but it was uh, it was rough. But I'm really glad to see that uh, the average level of bands when it comes to this topic in particular has gotten better because yeah, the, the, I remember at the start of it, it was people were getting guitar pro and M boxes. And so they were, when they were trying to record themselves, they would have like the worst DIs you could possibly imagine or guitar pro MIDI. And so that was kind of a rough time period because that's when bands started wanting to record themselves, but didn't know how. And so you'd have to deal with some really, really, really bad tracking. But I feel like now it's gotten to the point where there's so much information out there. People have been doing it themselves for so long that when, um, you know, a band say, say they hire a producer for drums then they track their own guitars and they go back for the mix and vocals or something or whatever, or they're just doing pre-pro demos, like they do such a good job now or they're capable of doing it now to where you might actually keep some of that pre-pro like you don't necessarily have to redo it all um or they could track their guitars and actually do a good job like hearing we're going to track our own guitars no longer means a oh, fuck yeah it's gonna be a bad time yeah definitely i mean that that's the case with the new silosis record i'd always i'm always for the last few albums want to demo the demos to the complete highest standard possible. So if I do something cool in the demo, like a solo, I don't have to just re-record it. It's already done. Or like all the synths or everything else, like or the ambient, like all the bells and whistles stuff anyway, or we'll just get just from the demo to the final thing. And sometimes vocal takes, you just hit upon a good take in a demo. Man, the, I, I was just talking to the periphery guys <laughs> uh on a podcast and they said the same thing uh, on this most recent album they put out. Um, Misha pushed them a little harder in the writing stages to make sure that like, if they were laying down a demo that they did it well enough to keep so that they won't have to re-record it. Because sometimes, as you know, I'm sure you've experienced this, you might retrack it better, but it's not better. 
it's like worse, even though it's better, it's worse. Like you can, yeah. so there's some things you just can't quite recapture. So if you took the time to get it right, right at that moment where you're inspired by it, like that's, that's the best. I think especially for guitar solos or um, vocals, like sometimes you'll do a guitar solo and you might improvise something and you hit this like harmonic yep. that just sounds incredible and it was an accident. And you can't it, try and find it again. You just can't do it. Or your voice might crack in a nice way that you can't replicate. And yeah, or, or you just sound pissed off or whatever it may be. Uh, yeah, it's always good to have that in so, the bank. So what do you do to make sure that like your demos are up to par? Is it like a matter of like constantly maintaining your guitars, like routine for having strings changed out? Like what's the, what are the things that you're like, I guess the baseline standards for when you're demoing and writing to make sure that like you're not coming up with garbage takes. Admittedly, there's not much to do. Like I have uh, my microphone on a certain input on here that just doesn't get touched. I mean, it doesn't really matter too much, especially like screaming vocals. It's going to get slammed anyway. So if I move it ever so slightly, it's okay. Um, the guitar DI, that definitely doesn't get touched, the, the input level on my interface for that. Um, I'm not as religious with changing strings as I should be. The sort of stuff that I mainly keep is, I've, I've always done this thing with solo systems since a very first EP is like layering up at least like 20 guitars all playing different sort of lead lines, improvised, like a 20 second reverb delay. And I kind of, it just creates like this synthy sound. Everyone's always like, what synths do you use? I'm like, it's just guitars. And it's just em emulating Devin Townsend and stuff. Like, I remember he did some cool stuff like that on the first Misery Signals re record. And I think that's kind of why I got the idea. Oh, tell me more but about this. So this has become a huge part of our sound that people always think it's synth. So I'll just, if there's like an epic section in a song, like the big, yeah, the, grand, the part, like melodic, the part, yeah, or a chorus, whatever it may be. I will improvise really basic melodies with a delay on, pan it left and right, and then pan, do another two, maybe a little bit more in with another two left and right, and just pan them all over the place until I've got 20. 20 different melodies, like 20, like. Yep. And okay. then I'll hit, put a reverb on the whole lot, um, which is at least 20 seconds. So it just turns into ethereal ambience. And then put it all in one group and take all the low end out and it just and put soothe on it to take care of any like whistly frequencies and uh it just becomes this like blanket ethereal thing and every now and then like a melody where i might have like doubled up on something that i was like oh that's a nice thing that i might have emphasized at one po point in in the song or, or that section might like, peek its head out and then sometimes it's just like ethereal ambience where can i um, hear this every song we've ever done. The first okay. song I did okay. it in was uh, a song called uh, Casting Shadows on our first EP, which isn't on Spotify anymore, but there's a section where it's like, dun, 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 and there's loads of space where you can just hear this ambience creeping in. Um, or like the the last track on our first record, Conclusion of Age, Oath of Silence. I'm gonna, uh, uh, actually, um, I'm going to pull it up right now. I want to I want to hear this while we're talking about it because um, cool. I love I love guitar layering. Um, m most songs of mine have like anywhere from twenty to fifty or more guitars. So like, and I love 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 layering guitars. Um, so I want to hear about this. Uh, I like doing it, and when it's in an ambient way like that, where you, where you can do it in a way where you can lose all the low end and it doesn't turn into like a weird yeah. tone. Because if you layer up loads of guitars, like melody guitars and chords and stuff with distortion, it's a nightmare. So in the mix. A conclusion of an age? Yeah, let me let me help you find the timestamp. So it'll, it'll be three quarters of the way in, I guess. There'll be like a guitar solo and then... Um, a song, Plight of the Soul? Oh, that's a bonus track. Sorry. Okay. Oh, so it's Oath of Silence. So it's Oath track Silence. 12. Okay. That, that's pre bonus track edition on Spotify. And it'll right. creep in with like just a few guitars doing a simple note and then it'll amount to a lot. Okay. 320. Let's see here. Yeah. Okay. Everybody go to Oath of Silence 
on Spotify and about three minutes, 20 seconds in. So just to clarify what I'm hearing. So is it through the, that entire section? Um, yeah. And it, it would just, I mean, the song fades out and you can okay. hear it. It would just be the clean that sh- guitars that, of that. That thing that's like shimmering in the back throughout the yeah. entire section, letting it fade out. Yeah. Or, or if, I mean, yeah, you can oh, take Oh, that's cool. So question. Pick. Okay. All right. Now I've heard it. Here's my question. So you're saying that you improvise melodies, but like, are, but it sounds here like you're moving along with the chord progression. So are you improvising melodies like in the same key or like going with the chords or like it's just random so, shit? Sometimes it, for the most part, it's just random. And like, I, like I say, sometimes I might play something, just a lead line. I'm, my, my theory's locked in, so I'm not, I rarely hit a bum note and I'm just improvising. Got but it. Sometimes okay. I'll be like, oh, I like this. Well, I did that last time, so I'm going to do that again this time. And maybe I'll have four of the tracks where they're all doing the same thing or they've got a looping pattern, but some guitars that will keep getting added will be different and they will just be, it would just be a wash of sound. Um, another good example would be the epic section in a song called Eclipsed on Edge of the Earth, which is track 13. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not the only person that's put like ambient guitars in stuff. Um, you know, like even... Uh, Tom from Architects, he was using like a Strymon pedal towards the end and doing like oh, a lot of cool. that kind of thing on the, the cloud setting. So where in Eclipse? Um, I'm looking at the track Eclipse right now. 307. 307. All right, everybody. Um, maybe in the future, I'll figure out how to actually play this through. But uh, for now, you're going to have to just follow along. So the song is Eclipsed. I said Losis. Three minutes, seven seconds. Let's hear it. I love that. It sounds like a synth. Yeah. I mean, th- there's obviously a, a lead guitar line over that as well that is masking it. But it's, uh, if, if you, if I was to mute these guitars, you'd be like, oh, where's all the ambience gone? Where's the mm-hmm. epicness? Um, so sometimes they're a bit louder or quieter in the mix, but they're, they've always been there. But um, yeah, I, I, it's just trying to emulate. Devin Townsend stuff specifically on the first or yeah that Misery Signals record the first track I was like what is he doing there and it was just like I couldn't figure out so I was like oh well just keep keep throwing guitars on it interesting that you said that your theory is locked in so you're improvising but you're improvising to the song so like I guess what I was trying to clarify is it's not just some random 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 shit like you're not playing like a different song like you're improvising to what's happening yeah right? just just like a just a like how john mayer might may improvise it's tasteful mm-hmm. it's not like yeah. trading i'm okay. not playing anything fast but it's in key i'm not really like thinking i'm just trying to do like a, yeah. a tasteful guitar solo but there's about 20 guitar solos yep. going on well the reason i'm the reason i'm asking up. the reason i'm asking is just for just so that someone someone's going to go try this and just play a bunch of random shit and they're not going to get yeah. the same results. And they're going to say, but you said just play anything, but you're not just playing anything. You are playing the right key. Like yeah. you, you are keeping it like, that's why you can hear that when it's moving with the song, it's like the right chords and the right, it has the right yeah. contour to it. It's I'm not, trying to just play a solo that like a really tasteful, simple solo yep. improvising over that section. And every now and then there'll be a song where there's a, chord that's in a different key and I have to remember when that comes up and mm-hmm. I also have to potentially do an edit um, once I've added the reverb because you don't want 20 seconds of reverb with the wrong note that's going to be in the next section with a different key. But and, and going back to the Demi Borger thing, another reason I started doing this was because I had a very strict no keyboards allowed approach and this would allow for like an epic something to elevate the song tonally or like bells and whistles without it being a synth. Mm -hmm. and still feel like organic and we also used to we do play to a click live now but we used to just have an spds pad with those samplers that a drummer would hit and it wouldn't be in time but because it's just a wash of sound it's not really you can't really pick out the melodies it wouldn't matter if we're not playing to a click or if we're playing like 10 bpm faster because it would just do its job yeah. Weirdly, like you, you watch any footage from us when we used to use the sampler. And when that comes in, sometimes you'll see footage where it's like deafeningly loud and it still sounds awesome because it's just like, ah. 
Yeah, it's it's <laughs> interesting the that the more intent or the more like the more seriously you present something or the I guess what am I trying to say that I'm not getting out right? Like having it come out like that and sound that awesome, I think like people people will accept it. Like people will accept something if it's presented as like this is the thing. This is the thing. They won't question it if it's that awesome. Yeah, I love um you mentioned the Strymon, that thing's great. Um, so is Valhalla Shimmer. Like there's there's all kinds of great stuff out there, but like I it was something I love doing is to layer up like say there's a chord progression, um, grab an Ebo and like write out basically record the every note in the chord, but I mean up an octave and down an octave. So you've got something like even higher or lower than that sometimes, but you end up having like 15 or 16 Ebos playing the chord progression along with it. And then, yeah, putting like shimmer or something on that or like crystallizer, like something cool like that to where you can no longer tell that it's an Ebo. It's just this like smooth, is smooth, ethereal, just chord and you know with an ebo again you there, there's no like real transient right so there's no and you're not going to move every single one exactly the same time it's just yeah it's so that it's more just like morphs it morphs from chord to chord very very nicely kind of similar to what what it's yeah, a similar it sounds, sort of thing yeah similar mindset it's uh it's that that kind of thing yeah, just just a cool way of adding a different sound to a metal song. And especially like what you're talking about as well, people won't necessarily be able to put their finger on it straight away. Yeah. Uh, another one I plug in I've used recently is Little Alter Boy. Oh yeah, that's a good and one. When you when you feel like loads of stuff into it, it can't it doesn't do very well. <laughs> but I deliberately used it on like those ambient guitars and architect stuff, because it would be like mm, and do these weird little glitches which for a more industrial sound. I was like, oh, cool. It just sounds weird and messed up, like a deliberate little loop thing. But it, it's just Alter Boy not, not being able to deal with all the information. Man, I am totally spacing right now on this plugin that I want to tell you about. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Like, this is um, our orchestrator, Jesse Zaretti, showed me showed me this plugin. So are you familiar with Freak Show Industries? No. Okay. There's a plugin called Mishby. Um make a note of that. Yeah. Freak Show <laughs> Industries. First of all, they have the coolest website out of any plugin company on earth. Um and their plugins are free. Like it's like, you know, you can <laughs> give a donation, but like you don't have to spend any money to check this thing out. And uh, so the Mishby is like insane. Like you should check, you should download Mishby and fuck with it. Um, if you're, Tape if you're, abomination. yes, if you're into doing this sort of thing, um, get this. I like the sigil on Dude, it. Dude, it's great. Instantly want it. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, they have the coolest they have the coolest plugin website ever and like the best plugin marketing ever. But like the stuff sounds like what you're seeing. Like it does sound like a satanic octopus is like. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, these plugins are phenomenal. So like for combining with the types of layers that we're discussing, like, yeah, let me know what you think of that stuff. It's definitely, it's fucking nuts, but uh, we're almost, we're almost out of time. I want to, talk to you a little bit more about mixing like um so at what point in time did you start to feel like all right i can do this for real but for real i mean like something that would be put out on a label and at what point in time did the people you work with agree um wasn't really all that long ago it was to be honest it wasn't something i was pushing a lot i was i was getting better but I wasn't necessarily really pursuing it as a career. I was just doing it on the side with soloists and mainly just for my own demos. And every now and then I could record bands for money to keep 
you know, doing solos as a mm-hmm. B-minor boss and that sort of thing. But it was it was really um, uh, Cycle of Suffering, which is the, not the most recent, but the album before uh, the solos is put out in 2020. Um, I felt like from like 2018 onwards, I leveled up. Main, the, the main thing was I got a new set of monitors. Ooh, and that, that helps. really... Yeah, and treated my room properly, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't about the plugins, it was about the listening environment. So I, I got a set of Adam S2Vs and got quite a lot of, and made quite a lot of acoustic treatment that's in my room currently. And uh, yeah, I mean, not to blame the speakers, because that's, you know, it's a bit of an excuse, but honestly, like the old speakers I had were just so bad. A little five inch. Um, I won't name the company, pretty well-known company, but they were just bad. Um, so that, yeah, once I could really hear what was going on and I could like tell what was happening in the low end and the guitars, um, I do you know what? The, the, what I did was something that a lot of people would say not to do, and I used my eyes, and I learned a lot from Pro-Q2, mm-hmm. Fab Filter, EQ. And what I would do is find... Uh, parts of songs like either an isolated guitar tone or a snare on its own in a song and just like look at it in Pro-Q3 like what's the EQ curve look like what do my favorite EQ curves on a kick or a snare look like and then I'd quickly like try and emulate it and not you know you can go a bit overboard trying to emulate every little peak and trough on a EQ curve but doing that taught my ears kind of what I like and I to replicate what I like I and I know I can mix now without relying on <laughs> Pro-Q3 with my eyes, but that was a big part of um, me stepping up and just trying to reverse engineer stuff. Um, so there are a few instances where I'd find like a someone would send me like a raw guitar from an album and I'd know what the final uh, album tone was, like what EQ moves I'd done, like run an EQ match. Oh, they're boosting low end on a guitar at 80 they're boosting 10k lows like that's the sort of thing that um i'm going off on a tangent now that i you'll hear all this like low high pass filtering guitars keep them locked in but loads of my favorite tones from early 2000s are like there's a lot going on in 10k yeah it, like, so, Colin Richardson tones. so i think that like the mixing with your eyes thing um like at least when i tell people not to do it what i mean is do it do it without when people do it without listening or they do it without listening yeah. or they assume that something is going to work because of how it looks or because of how a yeah. setting looks like what you're talking about doing is just f- using your eyes as a reference for your ears and like learning, learning how the way different curves sound and look at the same time. I think that's different. Cause like, you're yeah. you're using it as an you're like I think that that's one of the beautiful things about DAWs and digital technology is the fact that we can identify things visually as long as we're still using our ears and like it's all working together that's why not yeah and I'd, I'd always like do a mix bounce it down and then come back to it the next day and just listen to it without looking at anything and be like oh that sounds terrible or like my snares disappeared mm-hmm. or whatever it may be and then you just yeah or, or even if it's like a, an eq curve that even if you have to go against what your eyes are telling you <laughs> but you do you just have to like sometimes i'd i'd uh like draw in an eq curve on fab filter that i thought looked good but then just use the cubase eq to correct it again afterwards to act to have where it actually needed to sound and not care what it looked like but it, it definitely helped um but yeah, I, I, you know what? I'm also really good friends with Nolly, and uh, that's I have helpful. A, I have a chat group with him, with another friend, and we just discuss production stuff. He's really like forthcoming with like sharing his uh, his knowledge um, as well. And I have a different. We have very similar. Um, you know, we both love a lot of those classic Andy Sneap, Colin Richardson guitar tones, and we. He's like in particular started a huge time quest in, you know, the vintage 30s oh, and stuff. Oh, yeah. And my, I, my I main remember cab, him telling me about that. Yeah, I bought my main cab that I use off him as well. So it's been uh, sourced nice. by Nolly. But that, I mean, that, you know, making friends with people that um, 
you know, do do good stuff and try and pick in their brains when you can. Also, Scott Atkins, who we've worked with a bunch, he did Conclusion of an Age, first solo record. He's done a, loads of stuff with us, but he also co-produced the new record. But um, he's worked with Andy a lot on a Monomath. He uh, engineered the Evangel... What's the word? Behemoth with Colin Richardson. Evangelion. Evangelion. Uh, yeah, that's one. He engineered that one yeah. and he does amazing stuff, all the Cradle of Filth stuff. And I, every now and then I'll... I don't like to like annoy people and just like, hey, tell me all your secrets. But I just like picked my time to be like, what do you do for snare when this is happening? Yeah. <laughs> just pick one question to not bug them. And uh, years of, you know, speaking to people like Scott and Nolly and uh, re- recently I've been really digging Chris Clancy's work and got to be friends with him. So yeah, just he's good. Tastefully yeah. ask for help. Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> That is how it's done is uh, people who are further along pass it down to. But I mean, I think that the key is actually doing the work while and then asking questions based on yeah. the work that you've done. Right. I think sometimes it's, it's people, fun as well. Yeah. Like reverse engineering stuff like that's part of the fun. I get addicted to doing it and I'll, it will take up like an evening of like, oh, how did like how do they get that snare to sound like that? And like, why has it got so much sustain? And and uh, it's more fun to try and figure out yourself than to just ask someone. And I also, as much as I love all these guys that I'm friends with as uh, engineers, I've got my own idea of how I want things to sound in my head. Yep. So as much as they're all amazing for for solos and stuff, I'm like, well, I like that guitar tone, but I would want a slightly different approach with drums or whatever it may be mm-hmm. to to where it would be my own sound that makes perfect well. sense well josh i think we're out of time i want to thank you very much for taking the time to uh to hang out um the new stuff sounds Thanks great having stoked to be having you on nail the mix stoked for your upcoming riff hard uh material and uh yeah i'm stoked you're doing well thank you so much thanks for having me back anytime <laughs>